In this video, I'm going to make a quick survey of the research done for offline reinforcement learning up to year 2023. Offline reinforcement learning trains a reinforcement learning agent only with data, unlike traditional reinforcement learning where the agent is trained by interacting with the environment. This is good for cases where interacting with the environment and making failures is unacceptable or catastrophic. For example, if you want to train a reinforcement learning agent to come up with a treatment for a patient, it is unacceptable that you poison a person just to train the agent, or in the case of autonomous driving. So also it's very useful in cases where you have a lot of data that you can use uh, for training the agent. Uh, so when you train the agent only with data, with a lot of data, then this problem becomes more like a classical deep learning uh, where a lot of data becomes powerful. So the same applies in here. So these are the papers that I'm using for the for this presentation. Most of the material comes from the first one and the third one, which are surveys, one from 2020 from Professor Levine. And the first one is from a university in Brazil if that is more recent. And, or, and I like the way that it organizes the topic. So most of the material comes from those ones. And also I include some of the most successful agents for offline reinforcement learning, like Combo and implicit uh, language Q learning. And the other papers are referenced indirectly, for example, uh, IQL, which is one of the best, and also AWAC, COG, and others. All of these links are going to be in the description of this video, including the video from Professor Levine, which is link number two. Here are the two papers, survey papers that I use for this uh, presentation. And below is an image showing the difference of offline reinforcement learning with classical uh, approaches. The first one is the, the one most known, which is basically that you have a, a, an agent that interacts with the environment, takes an action, you get the new state, the, the reward, and use that data point to update the agent. And then the agent keeps interacting, etc. For off policy, you get a buffer, a bunch of interactions, you store it in a buffer, train the agent, and go back and get more data to train it again and keep training it. So offline reinforcement learning is like off policy reinforcement learning, but you don't go back. So basically you just uh, get a bunch of data, a lot of data, uh, train the agent and just deploy it. So here's a, an, a picture from the paper, the Brazil uh, survey paper from 2023. And it's the same image, but uh, there's a, an additional optional connection. So in offline reinforcement learning, once you train the agent, you can go back and do online training uh, and this is what they call fine tuning. Sometimes fine tuning can help. Uh, sometimes it might, uh, yeah. So it's an option. It's an option that you have. One of the most common applications of offline reinforcement learning is, is robotics. And the robotic hand uh, for different tasks is one of the most common uh, benchmarks that they use. They have used it successfully various times for grasping and they use dynamic programming. They have used model based. They have used a, a blend of using model based and model free. And sometimes they predict the reward in their models or they can predict their, their states. They have also used it for uh, mobile robots and autonomous driving. Also, one of the main applications is healthcare. As I mentioned before, in these applications, you cannot fail. So the offline data is a uh, training on offline data is uh, is a must. Unlike uh, autonomous driving and robotics, you it's not easy to make a simulator on these cases, and people have to be careful of, of because the data could be biased toward positive outcomes. And but they have been developed the uh, data sets uh, for for this, so that's a good thing. So this has been used for healthcare for quite a long time. In 2008, they used it for reducing epileptic seizures. Uh, they, uh, although I'm, I'm not sure if this is using offline reinforcement learning or just reinforcement learning. They, they, they have used Q-learning, actor critic methods, uh, using this data set that I just mentioned for drug recommendations. Uh, they, uh, they use it for schizophrenia, also for model, uh, for treatment, for lung cancer, uh, etc. The survey mentioned that uh, for autonomous driving, uh, the survey mentioned that uh, it has not gained a significant application, but is gaining popularity. An advantage that this field has is that you can collect a lot of, a lot of data, and also imitation learning has become popular. 
and yeah, uh, one advantage that this field has is that you can make very uh, powerful simulators uh, that can compete with offline reinforcement learning. I'm going to give a brief overview of uh, reinforcement learning and then go to another brief overview of offline reinforcement learning. And eventually I'm going to go through each category of algorithm used for offline reinforcement learning. Most of the reinforcement learning environments are modeled with Markov decision process, which is basically a graph of states and actions. So you have a set of actions, and when you are in a given action, you can take in a given state, you can take an action, and that action sometimes leads you to another state with 100% probability. So the the observation, the states are modeled with are denominated as S. The action set is A, and the transition to another state, A given the, the the current state and action is given by t so this is the current state the action taken and the new state so there's a probability sometimes this probability is 100 percent sometimes it could be less than 100 percent for example in this case you you're in state one take action zero and that have 70 percent of a probability of going to this state 20 percent of going to this state and 10 percent going back to the same state that's an example of that is the frozen lake environment, a slippery walk, and things like that. Also, you have the initial state, you have the reward. Given a state and an action, you get a reward from the environment. And also, there's a decay of reward. As time goes by, the reward gets lower and lower. So this is a way of formulating this. So you have the probability of transitioning to a new state, given the current state and action, the action taken by the uh, by the policy and the initial state. So this is your trajectory. So it's a sequence of states and action. So the Markov uh, decision process has the property that the next state solely depends on the current state and the and the action. There's no uh, regard uh, for the past. There's no accumulative accumulative uh, effect. In reinforcement learning, you're trying to find the policy that maxis, maximizes your long-term reward. This is a way of formulating it. These are your rewards uh, from the initial step to the final step in the episode. And you want to take the, the the policy that maximizes that. And also you have a decay, so the reward gets discounted. And you might think, uh, okay, this is not optimal to... Uh, going greedy is not always optimal. Uh, yeah, that, that is correct. But one thing about this is that you're looking for the long-term reward. So uh, by, uh, by looking for the long-term reward, you're basically doing smart planning because you are not uh, guiding your actions based on the short-term reward which could be low, you can take a, a low short-term reward to maximize the long-term reward. Still, there are strategies for uh, exploration uh, that uh, helping this to explore the state space before going greedy. There's a bunch of literature about that. Okay, so let's go to offline reinforcement learning now. Uh, no, sorry, off-policy uh, reinforcement learning. Off-policy reinforcement learning, if you remember, it was the option between the two extremes, the online reinforcement learning and the off offline reinforcement learning. So in here we take a batch and from that batch, uh, this is seen from the point of view of Q function. There could be other options. So in here we get the data and with the data we train the Q function. The Q function is basically estimating the long-term reward given the state and action. So you can he see here that uh, the, the, the long-term reward of the next state plus the reward of the current state which comes from the data collected it's going to be differentiated between the, the, the one predicted for this state and action and you minimize the difference. So the Q function is going to approximate the long-term reward. Then uh, you get a bunch of data, you uh, retrain it, and then go back with the policy that's going to be the argmax, uh, taking the maximum reward for the given Q and get more data and keep the cycle going. Okay, and again, the difference between off-policy reinforcement learning and offline is that you get rid of this step in here. Uh, you don't go back. You just get a bunch of data and train your agent. But uh, there's going to be a problem with this. And I'm gonna, uh, the two paper, survey papers talks, uh, and a bunch of papers talk about it, uh, a lot about it. And the main problem is going to be the distribution shift. And doing actions that go out of the distribution, out of the data collected, Okay, let's see a way to visualize uh, this. For example, let's say that you get a bunch of data on uh, on a mobile mobile robot, and basically uh, in your data, 
you're taking actions uh, and states that go through this path over here and another one that goes through here. But let's say that the optimal optimal uh, uh, actions path is through through here, through this. This is the optimal. So basically, your agent, when you train your agent offline, you have to take this action. But these actions are outside of the data. So you don't have a, a way to predict that this is going to be the best or the worst. So that that's a problem. That's a problem. And that, was, that falls into a category of a distribution shift. So basically, you're out of distribution and the offline reinforcement learning training tries to push down the possibility of going out of the state, but you will not uh, be able to discover it like this. So offline reinforcement learning doesn't work in things like this, but uh, it works in what they call a, a temporal composition, I think is the term, or stitching, they call it stitching. So basically the idea is that uh, when you collect data, you kind of cover the space, something like this. You get out a bunch of crazy tra trajectories in which you cover this, uh, this space. But then uh, the offline reinforcement learning is agent is able to figure out that this is the optimal path. And in a way, it has seen all these, these the rewards for all these paths in here. But it just teaches together the optimal path. And although the offline, the data that you get have never gone through this path, but it has the, the, the pieces. You have gone through these pieces, so it knows that it has to go through here. And this is similar. This is another uh, example. You get all this data, but then it figures out, okay, this is the optimal path uh, down here. So the, the data is very important for this, that you get data that is covering, uh, even in pieces, the important par parts of the search space. So in here, uh, offline reinforcement learning should be able to excel. In offline reinforcement learning, you're gonna get a data set like this. Uh, a lot of data consisting uh, that in which each point is gonna be a state, an action, the next state, and the reward. And it's gonna be similar to supervised learning. In principle, uh, any offline of policy algorithm could be used for offline reinforcement learning, but not all all, all them are gonna be effective. So you have to devise a way to balance it, it getting the maximum reward, but at the same time, not go too far away from the data that you collected, because otherwise you will be making nonsensical uh, predictions. So uh, there, they have the term of a behavior policy, a pi b. This is a behavior policy. This is basically the policy that collected you the data online, <clears throat> and then you have a, a new policy, which is the one that you train with offline reinforcement learning. So uh, some of the approaches are going to be using creating a model. Uh, and uh, whenever it's feasible to create a model, for example, in physical systems like robotics, autonomous driving, uh, whenever uh, it's feasible to create a model, which is going to be like a simulator, then these techniques are going to be useful. Some, of, as I mentioned before, some of, ta of the times model-based offline reinforcement learning is used. Sometimes they mix model-based and model-free, uh, etc. Okay, in here, uh, this is from a uh, Professor Levin YouTube uh, a presentation, and it, sh it shows the workflow of offline reinforcement learning. So the first part is collecting the data, uh, and the data can come from human experts. It can come from random behaviors or a combination of both, and definitely expert, uh, expert behavior is good. Uh, it can help you get into the, to the optimal state, but also it's good to be random, I guess, uh, to get uh, examples of bad behavior whenever possible. And then you come up with your policy and then you deploy it. Okay, so in here, uh, uh, this is a taxonomy from the 2023 survey paper in which it shows different approaches for offline reinforcement learning. So one of the par uh, parts is a uh, first getting the data and you can filter the, the data uh, to get only good examples, filter out bad ones. Uh, this is using imitation learning. And then you have the uh, some of them are using model-based learning, some trajectory optimization. In trajectory optimization, they use transformers to basically uh, model your trajectory. The trajectory is basically, uh, again, is a sequence of states and actions and basically the transformer is gonna model that sequence. And then for model learning, you get rollouts. So you get additional data for training for this case. 
and you uh, train uh, the policy with those uh, data that, that are coming from your mole. And yeah, uh, so then you have other uh, things like imitation learning, uh, similar, is similar to behavioral cloning. And then you have actor critic, you have the one step, uh, which has proven to be effective, uh, one, uh, IQL, which is one of the best strategies is using this one. And then you have multiple multi step. Okay. So here uh, you have the chronology of the refor offline reinforcement learning uh, techniques. And DQN, probably this might be the oldest one, 2014. Then you have a BCQ. I don't know if this is behavioral cloning Q learning, I'm not sure. Then you have bear, ram, a, let me see what else, BRAC. A, a, in 2020, that's, this is where Professor Levine a, did his paper on the survey paper. And then you have a MOPO, a CQL has been a, a good one. And then you have COMBO, which is one of the most successful model based approaches. And then later you have this TD three uh, plus behavioral cloning. I have, I briefly mentioned this one. This is the minimalistic uh, paper approach, uh, which is basically does a slight modification on the TD3 uh, for offline reinforcement learning. And then you have a, one of the most successful uh, IQL uh, in 2021. And then the paper came in here, the survey paper. Okay. So here's a summary of the categories for offline reinforcement learning approaches. I'm going to go uh, briefly through each one of them. Uh, there's policy constraint, which I uh, understand could be direct or implicit. This is one of the most uh, successful approaches. There's, there's the important sampling, um, which modifies the policy gradient. And this, is, this was not very successful. Regularization uh, which modifies the Q functional policy. This is has has been successful. Uncertainty estimation has been bad uh, from uh, what what the survey summarizes. And there's more base. This has been effective for cert certain cases. One step has been effective as well. And so imitation learning trajectory optimization. I don't not sure if he if it hasn't been explored enough. But this is kind of interesting, the usage of transformer technology in there. And here's a, a very useful table. This comes from the 2023 uh, survey paper in which you have all the techniques that have you used and the map from those techniques to the corresponding uh, policies. Uh, one of the best, as I mentioned before, is the IQL, which is using policy constraint, the implicit one, and also is using re uh, value-based regularization and it's using one step. Another effective one is combo, uh, which is using policy-based regularization and value-based regularization. It doesn't use policy constraint and it's using model-based. And the minimalist uh, paper t is using TD3 uh, plus BC. This is very simple to implement, seems. And it's using, a, think, implicit policy constraint and imitation learning. And this is a, the trajectory, which is using a trajectory optimization. This is a transformer. One of the main problem in offline reinforcement learning is a distribution shift. It's basically that your policy is gonna be outside of the actions that you took, uh, that you collected in uh, during data collection, and if. And, and this is part of uh, the problem. You have to go outside uh, of this uh, data set that you're provided. Otherwise, what is the point of offline reinforcement learning? What's the point of uh, creating a, 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 an agent? Because if you don't go outside, then you already got your uh, problem solved. The thing is that you have to balance. You have to go outside the, the data space that you provided, but not by much. So there are various techniques uh, to balance this out and I'm going to go through some of them. So now let's go to a section of algorithm review. Let's start with one of the most successful one, policy constraint. For poly cons policy constraint, there are two options. One is direct and implicit. For direct, basically you're trying to estimate the behavioral policy 
and try to constrain the new policy to stay as close as, as possible as the behavioral policy. In the implicit, you do not uh, estimate the behavioral, behavioral policy and you could just constrain the policy to be close relative to the samples. So yeah, the constraint is based on the samples. As you can see in here, you have a function that compares the samples of, well, this looks more like implicit, but the, in the case of estimating the behavioral policy, uh, it can be difficult to estimate and it can, the agent can fail miserably if it's not properly uh, estimated. It could be too pessimistic and it might try to keep the, the new policy very close, too much close to the behavioral policy. So usually the, the implicit is the one that is working better so far. Uh, yeah, I, I think you, you saw in the previously that IQL was using implicit uh, policy constraint. Okay, here's a way of formally describing this. Uh, you have the Bellman uh, equation to uh, basically train your Q function to be as close as the the samples that you're getting the reward and uh, basically but also you have this uh, that you're trying to get your estimate of the new policy based on the samples in the d where d is a data set that is close to uh, the behavioral policy up to a certain threshold who et al if it uh, formulates uh, these policy constraints in this form and notice that uh, you get a term in the Bellman equation for uh, constraining the training of the Q function but you also get it uh, for the creation of the new policy so you get them in both the, the difference between the the new policy and the behavioral policy and the choice of where do you apply this constraint and how you enforce it but also i guess these parameters make a significant difference on the performance of these agents here is one instance of the direct uh, version of the policy constraint in which they have a term for a uh, getting the policy uh, this is the term which depends on the modeling of the behavioral policy and the behavioral policy is uh, entrained using supervised regression with a generative model and yeah, as mentioned before, if you don't estimate the, this well, you're going to get problems. And another option that they mention is a WAC. This uh, is a commonly mentioned option for offline reinforcement learning. And uh, basically, they use the advantage, uh, the advantage function. It basically, means that for a given action, uh, what is the advantage of the, over the others? A relative advantage. And yeah, although I don't see where the behavioral policy or the behavior or the collected samples are using here and there's another one uh, this uh, uh from fujimoto and gu they propose a, a regularizer for training the q function and this is the td3 and behavioral cloning so i understand that this should be the minima, uh, minimalistic paper that i'm gonna show later and they basically have uh, the action this have a penalty for the difference between that action and the actions in the in the collected uh, set so you can see that this tilde a comes from your new policy and this a comes from the data set that you collected and this a uh, lambda coefficient controls uh, the penalty of, of this so basically you train your queue uh, yeah uh, basically yeah, you, 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 I understand that you want to get close to the queue, the, train the queue, but also penalize for getting out of the out of the distribution. Yeah, to avoid the distribution shift. Okay. The implicit policy constraint method could benefit from online fine tuning, and we're gonna see later in the results uh, from Professor Levin that uh, some algorithms uh, do a little bit better once you do online uh, fine tuning after doing offline reinforcement learning. And examples of these are these two, a WAC and our that outperforms Bear and Brack after doing fine tuning online. Also, yeah, as I mentioned before, it, uh, finding the modeling, the behavioral policy can be pro uh, difficult. They have found difficulty on that. One thing that the 
Professor Levine's uh, survey mentioned is the KL divergence, but it is mentioned also that uh, is, uh, they are not necessarily ideal for offline reinforcement learning, and they express it in this way, like a ratio between the new policy and the behavioral policy, and you, with that you estimate the difference that you can use to constrain uh, the policy. And another thing uh, that uh, this uh, Kumar in this paper showed that Behavioral policy uh, doesn't find the, the goal in this simple example, but support constraint does it. Uh, for behavioral policy, I'm not sure if it's referring to a direct policy constraint. In summary, again, uh, estimating the behavioral, the behavioral policy is problematic, and authors like Peng and Nair have uh, think that using the samples like in implicit policy constraint is more effective. And the general problem in here is not uh, trying to balance the, the fact of uh, the need of not going out of the distribution, but with uh, still going out far enough so that, that you can uh, find the, an optimal uh, policy using offline reinforcement learning. Okay, now the other category of offline reinforcement learning algorithms is important sampling, in which you use a weight uh, for getting the policy and estimating these weights are have been found to be hard and they have problem with variances and you have to trade off a bias and variances uh, okay so i'm going to show where this is used you can see here that a, a important sampling is used in these methods you have to the doubly robust and marginalized neither none of these uh, i have seen that are the dominating ones so it's not a very popular method so basically the idea for example in here we are estimating the trajectory using the rewards and you put a term a, which is the ratio between the behavioral policy and the new policy and basically that becomes some weights that you have to estimate that's the idea and to avoid this bias and variance issues they directly estimate the ratio but this has been found to be untractable and it can be approximated with dynamic programming and there are two methods the forward which estimates the ratio directly and the backward which uh, is like a value function and then they derive the the ratio okay so it has been uh, as i mentioned it suffers from high variance has the multiplication ef effect and it exponentially blows up and uh, the behavioral policy is too different uh, from the current if if it is too different from the the new policy the importance weight be, become degenerate so this is uh, suitable when the uh, the new policy is very close to behavioral policy just different by a little amount uh, but the uh, offline learning, uh, reinforcement learning is not useful for, for this case and yeah, these are the limiting factors for important sampling, but it's not worth going uh, mostly to this. The next category of algorithms is regularization, which has shown to be a, a effective. And f in here, you have the Bellman equation. You want to train for Q. You have an extra term for penalizing when the your actions go too far away from from the from the data that you collected uh, online. So it's less conservative than policy constraint because it does not depend on the behavioral policy. So you can see regularization is, is a simple mechanism that is using the most successful offline reinforcement learning algorithms like CQL, a Combo, and also IQL. One example of the regularization method is the CQL algorithm, which has some success. And you can see that you have an extra term in the a, a, a training for the Q function and the intuition behind this is that the regularization is going to push up values that are seen in the distribution of the online data or the collected data and pushing down the values that uh, from actions far away from that uh, data and basically you have a minimum maximum optimization which uh, has an unstable zero point and Kumar has offered alternatives uh, for getting stability of this and this has been seen that outperforms the policy constraint methods in, in problems uh, that are 
about stitching and for stitching I refer that in the uh, collected data you have pieces of the trajectory but you don't have the optimal trajectory and from those pieces of the trajectory you get the optimal trajectory. The next category of algorithms is model-based method. Uh, one clarification that I should made earlier is that uh, these are different categories but as you seen in the chart uh, that I showed earlier they can be mixed together so you can have a regularization with model base they are not mutually exclusive they can be mixed uh, all the strategies can be mixed so this is one of the most successful the model base and it, it basically they try to estimate the trajectory or the reward function and typically they are easily estimated using supervised regression and this works well when you have enough data to cover the space but still you might need to have a uncertainty estimation and reward penalization to avoid out of distribution uh, actions because in general the data set of your new policy is not going to be equal to the behavioral policy for which you used to collect the data still intuitively you might imagine that this uh, kind of works in uh, scenarios where uh, your environment can be modeled. For example, in the case of a robotic arm or autom autonomous driving, there's a lot of, uh, you have a, a, a physical work can, that can easily be modeled. So if you come with, a, so if this strategy can get you a model of the physical environment, then you can easily uh, train it offline. So in here, uh, some examples of model bases are Bremen, uh, Mopo, and Morel. And a combo which I understand is the better of them. Notice that a, a MOPO and Morel uses uncertainty estimation and this is because they want uh, to avoid going out of the distribution and combo is using regularization and this has proven to be more effective using regularization than uncertainty estimation. So again they want to uh, a model properly uh, the environment but still they want to uh, uh, penalize the actions that uh, go too far away from the behavioral distribution the uh, the distribution of the online uh, collect on, uh, data collected online yeah again uh, two of the most uh, co uh, po uh, methods for model based training are bremen and combo and combo uh, tries to make actions uh, not looking like real data look back and that, that's why it uses regularization and Trabuco argues that this regularization term is similar to adversarial training where you're trying to penalize out of distribution data uh, to basically make it, make it look like real data basically. It has been shown that model-based offline reinforcement learning is effective uh, for Atari games, uh, but those are uh, they predict uh, the state, the image. Is, they're usually simple problems, but it, as you're gonna see in results later, it is also effective for robotics, uh, for physical problems like a cheetah, a robot, or some things like that. Uh, of course, it is intuitive. Uh, you need a physical model and physical model uh, is, uh, is a model so model base is effective for those and yeah uh, in general dynamic programming offline reinforcement learning predict the reward while the model base offline reinforcement learning predict the next state and it's currently a debate which one is better than the other it is argued that, argued that predicting the reward is more flexible and yeah model base is not effective for high dimensional problems So in general, a model-based a, a model uh, the approach is uh, have, uh, have problems with high-dimensional image observation and long horizons, and some environments are easy to predict, like physical problems, or other are uh, extremely difficult. But the, an approach that, uh, according to Sutton and Jenner, that works is to combine a model base with model free. So basically, use the model to get short rollouts, to get more samples for additional training offline, but uh, that's not the only part of your algorithm, and avoiding prediction of full observations. Another type of algorithm of offline reinforcement learning is one step methods. And most of the methods so far has uh, estimate the, the Q function and the policy iteratively. 
alternating between policy evaluation and policy improvement. But uh, in one step, basically, uh, you do both at the same time, and therefore you don't have to add constrain losses uh, to those functions because you're doing it at once. It's iterative dynamic programming and IQL, implicit Q learning, is one of uh, uh, uses this technique and is is one of the most successful offline, if not the most successful offline reinforcement learning algorithm. In summary of the formula that uh, Kostrikov is using in, in 20, a public paper published in 2021 is basically estimating the value function instead of uh, alternating between policy evaluation and policy improvement. And basically you estimate the value function and for that you use a loss, a special loss function. And this special loss function basically is going to penalize you when you have a negative value. And it's going to be uh, less penalizing when you have a positive value. And that's a, the intuition that I, that I understand from this is that when you have a positive value, that means that you have a good reward. So basically you want to have a good reward but also you want to uh, be as close as possible from, from, the, from the data. Okay. Another offline reinforcement learning algorithm category is imitation learning. It does not use the reward signal to learn a policy and in its core is behavioral cloning, but you filter on the cyber uh, behaviors uh, and this can be done uh, through supervised learning techniques and they use uh, uh, this D function that is an F divergence cross entropy. Uh, this, uh, you could have in this algorithm distributional shift problem as with the others. And this behavioral cloning is most successful when, you, when your data consists of expert behavior. But uh, again, uh, behavioral cloning is not the same imitation learning. You have the part of filtering the data as well. Okay, so let's take a look at where this is used. So you have imitation, uh, imitation learning. You can see TD3, this is one of them, the minimalistic approach, uh, which is a little bit successful. Okay, okay, so let's go back there. Okay, the final one, uh, this is the category from the categories of the 2023 survey paper, the final category is trajectory optimization in which they basically estimate a trajectory, which is a sequence of states and actions. And basically you learn a model to predict this sequence. So here's what you predict, basically a sequence of rewards, states and action. And a Chen in 2021, and it made a decision transformer that instead of using being search, it uses the the maximum possible return to generate expect, uh, expert behavior. And this, as you can imagine, you're using a transformer, so this is expensive to train and it performs well on sparse uh, reward setting. Uh, uh, and those are the cases where the temporal difference method, uh, methods typically, typically fail. I mentioned before that an alternative to model-based uh, paradigm is dynamic programming, and that is something that uh, IQL, which is one of the most successful uh, re offline reinforcement learning techniques, is using uh, is using uh, iterative dynamic programming. So in here, uh, uh, you can see that this is uh, uh, generic Q learning. So you want to learn the function that estimates the long-term reward based on the action and states. So in here, you collect some samples from your policy. And from those samples, you basically uh, get the difference, the error between the, your Q function and the reward, the real uh, uh, reward on the quotes. And with that error, you basically, uh, with the learn read rate, you update the weights of the Q function and keep updating the Q function. So for offline dynamic programming, offline reinforcement learning, you can use this by setting the S to zero so you don't collect data from the policy because it's offline and the buffer is uh, initialized to be non-empty because that's the data collected uh, the, the data collected for offline reinforcement learning. So basically it's mostly the same. It has been shown that dynamic programming has been successful for robotics uh, grasping problems uh, for about 500,000 grasping trials. And 
it has been shown again that online fine tuning improved the performance considerably after doing offline training. And yeah, Agarwal mentioned in 2021 that conventional Q learning dynamic programming algorithm work work well with certain data sets. Still, like other options, it suffers from distribution shift. But solutions for that include policy constraint again and uncertainty-based method. And again, this policy constraint, the implicit one, has demonstrated to be more effective. So let's take a look at what IQL is using. IQL is using implicit a policy constraint with dynamic programming and regularization and one step. So that's the most successful offline reinforcement learning is using. Okay, let's go back to where we were. Okay. So here's the uncertainty of estimation option. Basically, you have put a term into a policy to get the new policy, but this is hard to predict and problematic as we discussed uh, earlier. And the alternative is use conservative EQ learning with pessimistic, pessimistic values. So it's like a regularization term that is added to the error. And we're going to see that in a moment, how that plugins plugs in into the algorithm. Yeah, and this doesn't need uncertainty estimation. So if you go back here, you can see that the error is that you have to plug in this into line 14, which is this one. So you put the term in here uh, with this. And this estimate is, yeah, so this is the uh, CQL, which is one of the successful offline reinforcement learning is using this term to, to modify how you train your Q function. Actually, this algorithm is different from the previous one that I showed for dynamic programming. This is an actor critic of policy actor critic. Uh, in here, it is of policy. You use the policy to get more data, but in offline reinforcement learning, you have to get rid of this. And you have the update of the queue. This is the critic and this is the actor. So I understand that this will go into this. So yeah, line 14 into error. Okay, so let's take a closer look at the CQL function. So this is the formula that they are using. So this is the paper for where it comes from in 2020. And you have a term for a learning the Q function in here uh, as normal. But you also have a term that is going to push down a Q values that are far away from your data set. And you're going to push up those who are close. So you want to be close to distribution again, close to its distribution, but also you want to precisely train the queue so that you can have a good policy that uh, gets the optimal uh, behavior. Okay, going back to the IQL method, the implicit queue learning. Uh, this is from Kostrikov in 2021. This is the paper, and this slide comes from uh, Professor Levine's YouTube video. Uh, you want to estimate the value function uh, uh, using this uh, loss function. So you update the weights of the value function. And this loss function, again, is going to penalize the negative rewards and uh, not penalize that much the positive rewards. That way, you want to have a value function that doesn't deviate too much from your distribution. But at the same time, you want to have high rewards for getting a well-performing uh, agent. Here's some more details of the IQL and uh, basically your training for the value function. And I understand here that these actions are going to co be coming from this set. And this set is basically actions that uh, are in the behavioral policy if given a, a threshold. So your training using the data, uh, the, the, the data points that you got. That's what my understanding here. Okay, so in this paper, it's an improvement of the IQL. It's implicit language Q learning. Kostrikov was also in this paper in 2023, and Professor Levin was also there. And in the IQL, uh, they developed this algorithm that meets the following uh, requirements: that is easy to use, uh, able to optimize uh, specific rewards, practical, uh, practical in interactive settings, able to leverage existing data, offline reinforcement learning and has the temporal compositional property, which is what we this, uh, I described earlier, which you have a bunch of pieces in your data and you compose the optimal trajectory from it using offline reinforcement learning. So this strategy is good uh, for problems with high variance rewards. One of the advantages is temporal compositionality, as I mentioned before. Uh, in plain dynamic programming, it uh, has temporal compositionality, 
but it has a high system complexity, hyperparameter instability, and slow, slow training times. And this alternative is going to train faster, I suppose. So implicit queue learning is based on a dynamic programming using implicit uh, data support constraints, the regularization that you saw already, and the ILQL uh, fine tunes a transformer language model. Uh, that's one of the things introducing here to predict the state action of the queue function and the state value function at each token. So here's a diagram of their architecture, and they have three transformers here. They estimate the value function, they use a different loss function, the CGQL loss function shown here. And they have a transformer value function, one transformer for the behavioral policy, and then another for deployment for perturbing the, the data. Again, it's basically an improvement, IELQL is an improvement of, IQ, of IQL. A basically, this perturbation that you saw in here in deployment, a, is one of their main a, a features, and it improves. It's used for to improve stability of a natural language processing task. They add a conservative loss term, and again, they're pushing out of distribution. They're pushing down out of distribution Q values. For their experiments, they use a GP2, a GPT-2 transformers, and they have a, a one for the two independently, independently initialized trained Q heads and one value, value head. And yeah, they have a, the hidden dimension being a, twice the size of the embedding dimension, and they have three separate transformers, networks for training and two for inference. And as you can imagine, it takes a lot of time to train. Okay, so for the next paper is uh, basically they want to, their point is that with the, they mentioned that the offline reinforcement learning algorithms that have been shown so far are very complicated and you don't have to be that complicated that with simple modifications to existing algorithms, you can have great improvements. So they strive for simplicity and basically what they add is just a regularization term in here. And this is the TD3 a BC a option, a TD3 behavioral cloning. And you see the, the policy that you have the difference between your action and the action from the sample, and then a gamma to control it. Uh, we have seen this before. And then this is from the data, you train from the data, data set. As we saw before, they have this lambda coefficient to control the strength of the regularizer. And they normalize the data to have a mean of zero, a standard deviation of one that improves the stability of the learned policy. And yeah, basically this is the only change and they have the source code in here for the TD3BC. And the author basically stresses on the point that the community offline reinforcement learning research community has to be careful about the exploration for simpler alternatives be, be, instead of just looking for novelties and complexities. Okay, another successful algorithm is the COMBO, which is model-based policy optimization. And here's the algorithm. So basically, first, uh, you get the data, and you, using the data, you train your model. It's basically the probabilistic, uh, the, tran the, tran the transitions the, of the Markov decision processing here. And then uh, you basically uh, take rollouts uh, uh, by sampling from your uh, your policy. No, no, that's not your policy. The, the, basically, the from your model, you sample data, and then you get the rollout, and you a train the Q function using the equation number two, which we're going to see in a moment, and then uh, you improve the policy. So you evaluate the policy and improve the policy in two separate steps. So combo doesn't need uncertainty estimation, we have, uh, which have been shown to be problematic, and it estimates the dynamics of the model using an offline data set. So basically, when you do the training, the actor critic method uh, training, you use data both from the offline data set and also from synthetically generated from the model. And you have to penalize also out of a uh, distribution, uh, out of distribution uh, actions as well uh, as usual in offline reinforcement learning. So you can see here that a combo is less conservative than CQL. It is closer to the uh, to the true value. And 
This was published in, uh, yeah, uh, Professor, Professor Levin was also here for this one. And yeah, I think we, I'm going to take a look when this was published. Yeah, so Combo was from 2021. You can see it in here. And Combo is using regularization, both from policy and from value. So you can see that they have separate, they don't use one step. They do it a policy improvement and pol a policy evaluation. So they have regularization for both of them to avoid uh, for penalizing out of distribution values. And yeah, it is model based, of course. Unlike one step, again, it alternates between a policy evaluation a, and policy improvement. And here's a equation number two and number three. This is for policy evaluation. And they have a, a penalty term in here. So you can see that you want to uh, model the queue, but at the same time, you don't want to go out of the, of the distribution. But also when you uh, uh, get the policy, you also want that your data, understand that uh, your state should be here, and this is what you estimate. Somehow they're uh, penalizing the auto distribution here. Um, it might be through this beta or it could be this distribution which they have to choose. Yeah, well, let's take a look at the results. So they're comparing CQL, which is a combo dimension that is less conservative, and they show that they're significantly better than CQL. But again, uh, this is a mold based algorithm so you can expect it to perform well on physical systems like half sheet a jump a door closed this is ro looks like robotics the walker this is uh, physical systems again so there are other two model uh, based al alternative which uh, perform better than cql as well but this one performs better because they these guys are using uncertainty estimation and this one is using regularization uh, which is more effective and you can see also combo is outperforming here in here and cql is the worst performing seems like okay so again a uh, one point that the author makes uh, for this paper is that uh, it compares the the data obtained randomly versus medium replay and medium expert and the more expert data you provide the better it performs it seems yeah, again, um, uh, this is reiterating into the fact that uncertainty estimation is not performing very well and regularization is doing just better. Here are some of the challenges and future directions for offline reinforcement learning. Hyperparameter tuning is one of them. Uh, incremental reinforcement learning uh, could help offline reinforcement learning and also unsupervised techniques uh, regarding the labeling of the data sets. And the author of the survey paper mentions that uh, there has been a lot of focus on developing new algorithms, but the research have to focus also on improving the data for this offline reinforcement learning, because now we're like in the deep learning world where data is really important. And so what happened with deep learning, that the focus turned uh, to data here also has to, the focus to be turned to data as well, to improve the data. In the survey paper, I, I found uh, the the argument that I made at the beginning of this presentation that uh, these uh, offline reinforcement learning algorithms are uh, effective uh, when you have to do stitching, when you need a compositional, uh, uh, yeah, when you have a compositional structure the, of the trajectories in which, for example, in here, you might get the data of the chunks, but then you have to a assemble those segments to get the optimal trajectory. So that's where offline reinforcement learning is, again, a effective. Okay, so let's go to some evaluation of the applications and the benchmarks. So here you have a two type of problems. A one of them is a robotics and a like walking, a like grasping, things like that. But also you have a problems like the maze. So this is more like you have the, the rewards of the segments and you want to come up with the optimal trajectory. And even though you in your data, you don't have the optimal trajectory, you can still figure out because you touch all the 
uh, spaces. So let's see how these alternatives look. So you have the behavioral coning, the data transformer, I understand. A WAC, one step reinforcement learning. This is the minimalistic approach that did a small regularization modification to the TD3. So you have TD3 and behavioral cloning uses imitation learning. You have CQL and IQL. Okay, combo is not showing here, but anyway. So for the physical problems, I, they should have included combo. I would expect combo to perform better in here. But you can see that all of them perform more, more or less the same. And this simple solution sometimes performs better than the IQL. You can see, and this is consistent with the paper for this guy, that it sometimes performs better. And, but it's much more simpler than this one. Okay, that's for the physical systems. For the compositional problems, like the ant maze in this one, you have the IQL performs almost three times as better as the minimalistic approach, and also CQL performs uh, better. Yeah, so that's something to consider. Okay, so in here, we can see that, uh, let me see if this is the fine tuning. No, this is not fine tuning. Uh, yeah, uh, I forgot to mention that this is the data decision transformer and it performed well for physical ones, but not performed well for compositional problems like the, uh, the maze. And also this is behavioral cloning and behavioral cloning performs uh, almost the same as these techniques, but again, in composition problems, as I mentioned, uh, these two perform better. And AWAC uh, performs badly here, but it is, uh, we're gonna see probably that it performs well on fine tuning. So yeah, let's take a look. Yeah, so these results that I have shown here, uh, my bad, uh, are from the Le for Professor Levin's YouTube video that is in the description of this video. Okay, so here's the fine tuning. Okay, so you can see here that IQL uh, always is the best uh, that in terms of uh, improving for fine uh, uh, online fine tuning. So you train it offline and then you go to online fine tuning and improve it further. And AWAC uh, performs better on fine tuning, but uh, the offline perf no, does not perform well. And CQL, uh, yeah, also improves with online fine tuning, but not as much as IQL, but also it doesn't perform well. This is for the compositional tasks. Yeah, so for this task, IQL seems to be performing the best. Okay, so now this is from the minimalistic paper in which we are comparing TD3 and behavioral cloning, uh, the small regularization versus CQL, and these are the physical problems. And you can see that sometimes uh, T3 performs better than CQL sometimes. Uh, I think not always. Yeah, although, yeah. Actually, it always beats it. So this is inconsistent with the other results that I saw. So I don't know if this is benchmarking uh, from one side or the other, but uh, in here, T3, this physical system, there. Well, compared to CQL, that's right. Compared to CQL, it's better. So they're kind of consistent. But the CQL visit here. Yeah, but sometimes CQL beats it. But in the minimalistic approach, it always is beating it, except here, perhaps. Yeah. Almost. So TD3 V3 is looking better in the paper where they publish. Yeah. Okay. So, but one point that the minimalistic paper is doing is showing is that TD3VC, although it's more or less a, a little bit better than CQL perhaps, it trains much faster. So it's more simpler. Okay, so the 2023 survey paper mentioned about off-policy evaluation that is uh, convenient to use for hyperparameter uh, training. It helps with that. And yeah, I mentioned that excessively training the same offline data set can lead to poor solution due to overfitting. And this is a method that has to, uh, can be considered of integrating into a workflow. And three methods mentioned are model-based approach, important sampling, and fit queue evaluation. And they mentioned that the fit queue evaluation is the off-policy evaluation method that has been performing better. 
yeah okay uh, to summarize this long presentation uh, the takeaways and ideas uh, of this presentation in my uh, opinion is that uh, the main benefits of offline reinforcement learning is that it enables reinforcement learning uh, for the case when online reinforcement learning is not possible or practical. It turns the reinforcement learning problem into a data-driven problem, which is convenient when you have a lot of data. And the main problem of offline reinforcement learning is the distributional shift is basically when the difference between your learn policy and the behavior policy are far. And we have seen that a uh, offline reinforcement learning is a uh, good for compositional uh, stitching th that you have all the pieces that you have to assemble the optimal path, even though it's not in the in the data. But it's not good uh, when the optimal path uh, is not in the data that you collected. So basically, it is important that your data uh, has a good coverage in order for offline reinforcement learning to be effective. Okay, in summary, these are the methods that we have seen in this presentation. Uh, dynamic programming, which is used by IQL, uh, and this has been effective, but also model-based, uh, which is the alternative, is good for physical problems, we have seen. Uh, IQL is better for mazes, for compositional problems, uh, stitching, as we saw. And we have the problem of distributional shift, which can be addressed by policy constraint, direct or implicit. We have seen that the implicit is better, which is basically based on the data rather than a uh, modeling the behavior policy, which was problematic. A uh, policy constraint uh, method taking into account the, stat the statistics of the distributional shift and regularization has been proven to be effective. Uh, we have seen in various uh, of them, imitation learning has had success as well. And we saw that, that in the minimalistic paper, the TD3 and behavioral cloning. The one step, uh, the IQL uh, is using one step as well, which is basically combining, uh, instead of doing policy evaluation and policy improvement uh, separately, it does it in one shot. And there are other methods like uh, important samplings and uncertainty estimation which have not uh, were, that were not uh, success, successful so that's uh, all for for this presentation thank you very much